Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast, where we're helping leaders live with integrity. Whether you're a mom or a CEO, you're a leader, and how you lead matters. Welcome back to the Living Wholehearted Podcast. We're doing a really important series on sexual integrity. This topic really touches all of our lives, whether we want it to or not. And when we talk about shrinking the integrity gap between what we preach and how we actually live, it's vital. Uh, this issue is vital. It's at the center of all of our lives. Yeah, we, I mean, we know that none of us does this perfectly, except, you know, Christ was the only one that lived perfect. Uh, in fact, we just celebrated Easter and we're so grateful for Christ's forgiveness and his redemptive work. And grace means that we, we can't earn God's love or favor. And uh, what Christ did on the cross sealed the deal. It's finished. And so thankful that it is. Yeah. And however, we know that many of us um, were just afraid and still struggle with trusting God with all of our stories. Even though we love God and we profess that we want to give him our heart, our mind, our body and our soul, we really just do struggle trusting him with our humanity, the pain of our stories and especially our sexuality. So we have two brave guests, special people with us today as they want to tell us more and share with us the journey of their own sexual wholeness. They are in process and then, and they're willing to let us into their real uh, journey together. So welcome Josh and Jalen Harrell. Hello. We, hey guys. <laughs> we're so glad to have you guys. Um, so let's start, let's start with um, the, the fun part of your story. When you guys first met and um, help us understand how you fell in love and a little bit of the background. Go Sounds ahead, Josh. I say, you favorite. tell it so much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Josh, bring it. Well, you know, I um, I love our story because it's one because it's our story, but um, two because it's just fun. So we met, golly, we met in fifth grade. Uh, so oh, I love it. Way back, fifth grade church choir um, was our first <laughs> our first interaction, and um, and all through middle school we ran in the same friend group. And, um, and I actually, and everyone knows this, I had a big crush on her in middle school and I told her, and I just want you to all feel my pain because her response when I said that I liked her was you're a really good friend and I like your friend so-and-so. So (laughs) if that gives you an idea, not all stories start off with both people being in the relationship. So, um, (laughs) you know, I brought it up in our family. This is starting off very well. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and so you know we went through we went through all of middle school and high school running the same friend groups actually in in high school uh we went on frequent double dates but we were not together she was with a friend of mine i was dating someone else but we would go on these double dates and we would always joke about how alike she and i were and we would poke fun at it and be like oh haha josh and jay should be on this date together um because they're so alike and, uh, and just through, you know, obviously a lot of times the relationships you have in high school don't stick and, uh, coming near the end of high school, we had both come out of relationships and honestly, we were just, we felt so excited to just be able to hang out as friends because, you know, you, you don't, you don't hang out with your friend's girlfriend by yourself for obvious reasons when you're, when you're in a relationship. And so we just started spending time together as friends. And I had told her actually that, um, you know, after this long relationship I had been in ended and she was out of a long relationship too. Um, when we were in that kind of friend building stage and and getting to know each other more one on one, I had mentioned in a conversation that I didn't want to date again until I was sure the person I was going to start dating was going to be who I would marry. And this was, I mean, I'm a senior in high school at this point, but I I early on knew how important it was uh, for me, how much I wanted to to be married and to start a family. And so I had made that comment, and then probably within a week or two, I find myself, you know, falling head over heels for this girl that I've known for years. And freaking out, going, oh my gosh, I just told her the next person I date I want to marry. <laughs> so, you know, and um, much to my surprise, but not to my surprise, um, she, you know, she knew that that was how I felt. And we started dating that summer after our senior year of high school. Uh, she went away to college down in California. I started going to nursing school in Portland. And it was the every day, you know, back when Skype was the big thing, every day we were on Skype for, you know, two or three hours a night. We were, texting all the time. We were calling each other and um, we got probably partway through that first semester and we were like, this has got to, one of us has to move. Like I got to go down to California or you've got to come up here. Cause we just, this is, we both felt so 
sure, like we had talked about marriage early on in the months of our relationship. And I think the fact we had been friends for so many years, we didn't have to like establish a friendship first. We had already done that. And so we both knew what we wanted. And it was, um, you know, she ended up graciously and lovingly moving back up to Portland. Um, and, and, you know, we, our relationship got more serious from there and we got married in 2014. We were both just barely 20 or sorry, 2012. What am I saying? 2014, we had a kid. 2012, we got married. Um, and, you know, we were both newly 20. Um, there were, we had lots of comments from people about what that would look like, but, um, but it's been, you know, we've been, we're celebrating our eighth anniversary, uh, this year, okay. which is super exciting. And, Ooh. um, and probably in quarantine. So that'll be a whole new fun experience too. Um, and, you know, just uh, just super grateful for the journey that we've been on. You know, you guys will hear more about this, but our story has not been a uh, smooth sail, perfect ride. It's been a lot of a lot of things, but it's been filled with a lot of joy and it's been filled with a lot of, I think, just deep connection that, um, you know, she's my best friend. She's the one that I, I get to ride all the ups and downs with. And so um, I don't know if she wants to add anything, but that's, that's my little take on our story. Nice job, Josh. Nice job. Jalen, uh, tell us a little bit about the stage of life you guys are in now. You've been married eight years. Yes, we have two boys. Um, God bless me with boys. And so we have a five and three-year-old and they're a handful and a half, um, giving me a taste of my own medicine, as my mom says. And <laughs> um, it is just uh, it is such a fun time being a parent. It's also the hardest thing I've ever done. And it's really helped Josh and I, we really have learned, I think, the meaning of what God intends marriage to be through the challenge of children. And um, it's amazing just how he's used this time to reveal things to us that we needed to work on. And all through these kids that you think you're going to teach them how to grow up and, (laughs) you know, do, do life and they end up teaching you more about life than you teach them. Mm, so true that's that's great you guys and i love what love what you're sharing already and now we'd like to enter a little bit into the into some of the pain points um tell us a little bit more about how, when you knew something was up in your marriage and uh you you alluded to it a little bit here let's let's begin with that yeah for sure well i'll start josh since i know i probably you knew about it all along i think but um I just, we were, you know, we were going through typical marriage stuff. We got married in 2012, like Josh said, and 2014, we had our first kid, Landon, and he's five now. And, um, you know, I was just kind of convinced this is how life goes, right? Like you get tired, you grow apart, and pregnancy does things to your marriage relationship, right? And we just were kind of doing our best with what we could. We were babies when we got married. I didn't realize how much of babies we actually were (laughs) when we first got married because we were 20. But we had a lot of growing up to do still that I didn't realize we did. And so um, I started to notice. So 2018 was when we kind of faced our issues. But I was noticing in 2017 that Josh was depressed a lot. And he was very down on himself. He was changing careers almost every year. Um, He just was, he was one person with other people and one person with me at home. And he was in a dark place. And I remember just being the wife that wanted to help. I just wanted, I so badly wanted to help him. And I wanted to help him get out of this funk because I knew this wasn't who he was. And this wasn't the guy that I married. And just thinking, you know, what can I do to help? And so I sought out Tara. (laughs) I was like, Tara, please help me. I need help with this. And um, I came to her looking to help Josh with his depression. And I remember, Tara, you mentioned something to me about PTSD. And we went home and Josh and I talked about PTSD. And that, that therapy session, although I was coming in there very codependent and very, (laughs) very much like not knowing all that I was kind of unearthing at this point. But Josh had been in therapy at that point for a while. He had been on medication for depression and um, I just wasn't seeing anything change. Right. And I, and I couldn't necessarily feel, feel that anything was happening. And um, so I thought taking matters into my own hands would be the, the best avenue. But, um, I just, you know, suggested maybe if we go this other route, you know, what do you think about maybe talking to a different counselor about PTSD? 
And Josh was like, well, maybe I'll try that. And what kind of happened for you, Josh? I'll let you take it from here. What did you notice at that point? Yeah. Um, well, like Jay said, I mean, I have been at that point in 2017, I have been um, seeking out counseling and therapy for probably a year to a year and a half already. Um, I was on, you know, high doses of medication for anxiety and another one for depression and never really was getting clarity on what was going on and never really understood what was going on. And it wasn't until um, Jay said, hey, why don't you, why don't you look into this, this person that Tara recommended? And so I went and I don't know what, I don't know what came over me in that first session. I don't, I, I mean, I think it was honestly just God's goodness and giving me the courage to just be brave and, and open up. But that first, um, that first session was really where I started to discover that there was, there was more going on inside of me than I was, than I had been willing to, to let people into. And, um, and, you know, a lot of that had to do with, um, my own, my own story and my own history. And so, um, I, I had for a long time, just to kind of give like, I guess a broad, a broad brush for a long time before our marriage and Jalen knew this and, and we, it was an open dialogue, but, but before our marriage had struggled for a long time with a really severe pornography addiction, um, that had really, really it seeped its way into my life and become a really big crutch for me. And that started back in, in middle school. And, you know, at this point we're now in our twenties and married and had been this on again, off again thing where there were, there were seasons where it would ebb and flow. Um, and, and I remember after she had Landon, um, that, I guess that vehicle for my addiction had really subsided, but I hadn't really addressed the root of why it was that I was dealing with that. And, um, and, you know, she had realized that my depression and anxiety was just getting worse and worse. And it was in that, that first session that I had with my, with my own therapist on my own that I just poured out my story. You know, I, I had grown up in the church. Um, I grew up being very open about my, you know, with leaders and with, with mentors about my struggle with pornography and very open with that. But there was a part of my story that I had never really opened up about to anyone, um, not to Jalen, not to, um, not to a counselor, even though I'd seen multiple. And the part of my story that I was really scared to share and that I think was the root of a lot of this anxiety was that I was really struggling with my own sexuality. And, um, you know, being a, a man growing up in the Christian church where that, the topic of sexuality is already so, um, so tabooed most of the time, but then to, to take it one step further and say, I'm actually really wrestling with my sexual identity. Like I'm struggling with same sex attraction and I don't know where to go with that. I don't have a safe person to go to with that. And, um, and that the revealing of that and me sharing that in, in therapy and then subsequently sharing that with Jalen shortly after really opened up, I think a huge wound that I had, um, that at the core of it was was an own struggle with my own identity that I had been hiding since I was a kid. I mean, my earliest memories of struggling with that go back to when I was in late elementary school, early middle school. And here I am, you know, 26 years old and I've never told anyone. Um, mm-hmm. And so it really, it, it did, it opened up this wound that I had covered up for so long, whether it was through um, utilizing, you know, pornography as an outlet or it was... Um, you know, utilizing just my own sense of humor to kind of mask up the things that I was dealing with. Um, It kind of unearthed all that. And it made this, it opened up this kind of raw exposed space that really catapulted, you know, the following weeks and months of our journey through that. Yeah, so much there, both of you. Thank you for being so real and honest. Uh, Jalen, a couple of things I heard from you was just, you sensed something wasn't, um, I guess, right in your marriage and you sensed from Josh, um, his depression and that things weren't getting better. And so you, you were trying to have a posture of helping him. Um, and Josh, that sense of anxiety and depression were just persistent in your life. But obviously on this side of your journey and all the processing, you understand more of what was on earth, the holding of, um, and is it fair to say hiding of this part of you, this struggle, and you didn't know where to go. And, and I can totally validate that for, especially for our audience who's listening, it can be really hard um, in and out of the church, but particularly in the church, and if you're struggling with pornography addiction, same-sex attraction, just anything sexuality-wise can be hard to find 
someone. So here you are, Josh, you're growing up in youth group, you're telling your mentors, your leaders, you even were talking to Jaylen about your pornography issues, but um, something turned there in that counseling office. So I'm going to start with you, Josh, in that moment, you know, what, what do you think was that turning point to help you to decide um, that it was time to face this part of your story that you had had in, since you were a little boy, you said? Yeah, you know, I, I think there was, I remember a couple of distinct turning points. I remember one in, in that session and just feeling like I'm just tired. I'm tired of, mm-hmm. I'm tired of coming into these sessions being, you know, posing as being so authentic when in reality I'm hurting and I'm not letting anyone into it. And here I am in front of someone who, who is just simply here and invested in helping me move forward and helping me understand and if I can't be, if I can't be real with myself and, you know, this person who's here to help me, then there's what hope is there for me being real in my marriage or being real in relationships with people moving forward. And so I think there was that moment of realization that I was just tired. I was tired of, you know, fighting a battle with, without the weapons and, and just kind of letting this thing happen to me. And so there was that moment in that session where I just, I let it all out. And I remember, I remember my therapist, um, just, just kind of like jaw on the floor because this was our first session together. And here I am just Uh opening (laughs) up my entire, you know, I had been through probably 50 or 60 sessions with therapists before that and never shared this. And here I am in my first one. Like I said, I think honestly, just like the conviction of the spirit in my heart and saying like, this is, you need to take this step of healing. That's the only reason that I did it. Um, and, and so I did. And so there was that turning point there, but then I remember just a few days later, I hadn't shared with Jalen, um, about my struggle with sexual identity at that point yet. And I could tell like there was a day, I remember it so vividly sitting on the couch in our living room. And I just was, I just felt sick. I felt this like weight on my chest. I felt a pit in my stomach. I was just, I was quiet. I was like clenched fists sitting there. And I remember Jalen being at the dining room table and she's like, what's going, oh yeah. There, there had been a situation that had happened that kind of, she thought it was, this was a response to something else. And she said, this seems like you're, like you're having a lot, of, uh, a lot of anxiety over something that seemed pretty small. And what she didn't know is that the anxiety I was feeling was not related to this other situation, but it was related to this, this secret that I was holding in my heart. And so I asked her to come over and we sat down and I remember just like tears in my eyes saying, you know, I know you know this part of my story and my, my struggles with pornography and, and you've known that about us, but what you don't know about my story is this. And it was just this moment of, I think it was that moment of transparency and honesty, because up until that point, I had done a pretty good job at keeping certain parts of my life and my, my heart pretty hidden from everyone. And, um, Mm -hmm. and there was, as I started to move forward, I started to realize that there was a, a, a theme and kind of a thread of low, just, just low level enough deception that it didn't feel like lying that I had been doing. And it was mm-hmm. that in that moment where I chose to open up about one of the, the scariest, I would argue, the scariest and hardest part of myself, um, opening that up to the person that I trusted the most and having to trust that she was going to be there on the other end to receive that. And um, so I remember that being a huge turning point in just, in just stepping towards wholeness and transparency in our relationship that hadn't been there before. Enormous courage, Josh, and um, mm-hmm. we're, I'm right there with you as I'm imagining the choice you had to make. And just, yeah, that I think many of us listening and those, Jeff and I know those moments when you're just so sick of holding that and, and the years and years and years of that building for you. So the courage um, to let her in. Jalen, before we move forward and talk more about uh, disclosure and how to, how to move through that, Tell us about you. What's the turning point for you in terms of you facing your story? You alluded to the fact that there's some things you've had to work on too here, not just Josh. Would you like to speak to those? Yeah, certainly. So obviously that was a big, I was very much in a victim mentality when I heard that stuff, like I've been shot, like this is happening in my life. And um, it was, it was a lot of survival mode. But I immediately sought after, you know, guidance. And honestly, there wasn't much on this subject. And there wasn't much for me as a wife of a same-sex attracted male in the church. And I, the one thing I did hear, though, from listening to other betrayal stories was women who had owned their own 
stuff. And I was like, I don't have any stuff to own. <laughs> like I was so in denial about all of it. And, but I kept open. And I think that was the really important part because over these last two years of journeying through this restoration process, I've really learned that I played just as much of a part in this as he did. And to some of you listening to this right now, if you're a wife or a husband in my same situation where you've been betrayed, you might not feel like you are playing a part in this and that's okay. Like be there, but just know that there's huge redemption on the other side of that. Like God has healed my story in more ways than I could have even imagined and giving me a freedom of um, just like love and acceptance and worthiness. Like he restored the worth that I always tried to find in men through my story. And I actually realized through this process that I was sexually abused while I was growing up. And it wasn't as bad, I say this in quotes, as bad as other people's sexual abuse. And I always used to write it off as that, like, oh, Mm -hmm. I wasn't this, but it was. And it took a little while for me to see what had happened in my childhood and in my story and how that had affected me growing up to see the woman that God created me to be and how our marriage story and how Josh's, Josh's pain and my pain coming together and seeing God really, I mean, restored has been a word that we have clung on to in this process as a married couple, because that's really what God has done here. He has taken what was broken and shattered and he has put it together with gold. There's a, I don't know the specific Japanese term for it, but there's a process that the Japanese go through where they create art out of broken pieces using gold and they take the broken pieces and they put the gold in the middle of it. And it makes this beautiful work of art. And I just, I vision that. And I think about that when I think about our marriage, because it's not perfect, but it's being pieced together with the love of Jesus and the the restoration that he's done in both of our lives individually. And then when we come together, it makes this beautiful work of art because of what we've walked through. Yeah. And before we move forward, I just want to speak back to that woman you were talking to or that man um, who's a spouse that is not there yet. And Jalen, you're you're further down the road and you're healing. And I think it gives great hope and beauty for someone who feels betrayed in the relationship to say there is a day when you can actually be grateful if you can lean into the healing journey. And yet there's a lot of people listening that aren't there yet. And that's okay. I love that you said that. Just It's okay. You're right where you are. So um, yeah, th- this is years down the road. You guys are in process and working. And so a um, few more questions on this, and then we're going to wrap up this part one and, and move into part two. Yeah, you guys, uh, it's it's beautiful to hear the words that you've chosen to uh, share the story. And I'm uh, just so encouraged by it. I know a lot of people will be. Mm-hmm. I love the words that you used by Jalen by saying, I stayed open. Mm-hmm. And that just describes the process. And that openness is not easy um, because initially you felt shot. You know, I want to ask you, stay in that moment of that disclosure on the couch. And Josh, your fists were tight. Jalen thought you were reacting, overreacting to something else that was seem more minor. But there you were. There you shared what you shared with her. Um, you know, I, how did you feel, Josh, in sharing and disclosing this and this disclosure process with Jalen in that moment? And then Jalen, I know you described how initially you felt about it and how it's worked out in the past like to hear just a little bit about that from Josh in that moment. That's a scary moment. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it was, it was, it was arguably there's, I wish I could say, I guess I'll start with this. I wish I could say that the disclosure all came in one big wave and it was a single moment and there was every, okay. Everything's on the table now. Everything's here. And, um, it, it was like that first moment on the couch where I shared my struggle with her and I, and I shared, what had been going on in my heart, there was a huge sense of relief. I remember in that moment, um, because I was like, finally I've shared with the most important person in my life, you know, the most important human being in my life knows this deepest part of me. 
that I've hidden for so long. So I remember there being a huge sense of relief, I think partially because I had shared it, um, but I think also partially because of how she chose to receive it. It's not, you know, she had lots of questions and the questions only started there. It, it was, you know, months and months of lots of conversations. But um, but I just remember there... I remember there just being a, a piece of, okay, this is, this was the right next step and feeling like, okay, she's, she's staying and maybe we can continue taking steps. Maybe we can continue moving forward in that. And, and, you know, um, like I said, if I could go back again and, and disclose everything at once, I, you know, I don't think in that moment I was ready to, so it's probably good that I didn't, but there were other parts of my story. There were other parts of my addiction, um, from, you know, before our relationship and early in our relationship that I had never shared with her. And I remember that appointment um, where we sat down and I had, um, Tara, you had asked me to to prepare, you know, what's called like a full disclosure where you're sharing everything, nothing's off the table, like it's, it's the full deal, it's everything. Um, and so I remember sitting down and typing out this disclosure that I kind of wrote essentially like a letter of just everything, of all the things that had happened before our relationship, within our relationship, within our marriage, um, all leading up to that moment in time. Um, and that was a, uh, looking back on it, a freeing process, but in the moment, a very gut-wrenching, painful process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just of facing my own reality and facing my own choices that I think because they had been kept to me, they didn't feel real because, well, if, if I only know about them, then, um, mm -hmm. you know, then it's not, it's not really important. No one knows. And so it doesn't really matter, but sitting down and writing it, knowing that I was about to share it with the woman who I had made vows to and promised to love and mm -hmm. guard her heart. And knowing that I had, I had broken some of those vows and my choices, that was hard. Um, and mm -hmm. that, that process of, and then going through and actually reading through that with her as we sat in the office with you, Tara. And I, and I remember just there was the the weight being lifted off because I knew everything was finally on the table. But then I remember also looking at her and there was this new heaviness because what I had removed for myself, she now had this entire new story and narrative that had happened behind the scenes that she didn't know about mm -hmm. that she was now right. ha having to absorb or not having to, but choosing to graciously choosing to absorb and say, okay, I'm, you know, and, and listening. And then I, re I just remember watching her response to that and just seeing the heartache and seeing um, just the pain in, in her eyes. And I, I mean, it even starts to make me tear up just thinking about it, not because I'm sad um, now, but because I remember just the, the pain and, and it was hard. I mean, I, I think back to my gosh, the fact that she sat through that and the, the fact that she's stayed through it all um, is just mm -hmm. a testament to, to her, her gracious heart and, and God's work in our marriage. But it was a, it was a hard hard moment in our relationship for sure you guys just uh, you're showing um you're showing commitment in this and, and disclosure it's normal that that initial disclosure is not full and complete and you submit it to a process that's a healthy process of taking time preparing in advance as the one that's to disclosing and and realizing and Josh, it's just cool to hear your voice describe how you even now recognize Jalen and, and the choice that she made to stay open, to stay in this. And she didn't have to make that choice. And mm -hmm. it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful story. You guys are sharing in such authenticity. So I just want to validate that. Jalen, as the wife, are you willing to maybe put words to some of that pain or what that was like for you to choose to listen to that full disclosure? Because that is part of the option. I just want to make sure people understand that um, that only happens really with couples who are wanting to move forward and try for restoration. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, a must. It's a starting point to lay a, a, a kind of come to ground zero, basically, to say, Here's what we're dealing with. Here's the loss. And so Jalen, um, walk us through that for you. Yeah. So um, like Tara said, I when he first kind of told me what was going on, I really had a choice in that moment. Like I had a choice to walk away. And um, I really felt like because he had chosen to share those things, I knew that there was this person inside there that I needed to give this a chance because he was willing to do the work. And so I obviously didn't know that not everything had been said yet. And so every time, I mean, when he told me about the pornography, when we were dating, 
um, every time something was disclosed, it hurt a lot. And for not, for those of you who think pornography is not a big deal, it is, it hurts your heart. You can say it doesn't a million times. I know I said it, but, um, it hurts your heart. It kills your intimacy. And so that was something that, um, we chose to step into this process knowing that I knew it was going to be really challenging. And it felt honestly, like my whole first year of going through therapy felt like I was wearing this weighted backpack of just like stuff that I was carrying. And I felt like I had been shot. I, it, I had all the questions reeling in my mind and I just couldn't get them out of my head. And I was really thankful for good friends in that season that just let me took my kids so I could just cry and just were there in such strong community. So thankful for that. But as I'm sitting there in that, you know, therapy room in that moment and just hearing him say all of these things that I never even knew about, um, trust was fully broken there, fully broken. And I remember, um, I didn't really know how to feel at that point. I was just like, wow, like, I don't know what to believe anymore. Um, so then shortly after that, I said the words that I never thought I would be saying. Tara had always said this was an option on the table, but we talked about polygraph testing. And um, I did decide that I wanted that polygraph test. And I didn't know it would bring me such comfort. Um, and I never imagined I would ask my husband that ever in my life. But there had been so over the time where he first told me on the couch to his last sober date, which we're actually celebrating this month, praise the Lord. Uh, there were multiple times in there where there were relapses and there were confessions that he had made, you know, where he was still very much in his addiction and wrestling with it. And as a wife, um, I was just taking everything day by day, choice by choice. And wanting to protect my own heart, but also just listening to God and listening to like, God, are you really going to restore this? Are you really going to restore his heart? Because I want to make sure this is, I'm not getting too hurt in this either. And mm -hmm. so that was, for me, it was very much unknown. Like I didn't see the finite future with us. I, I wanted it to work out, but I knew there was a, there was a long way to go before we were in any place of like, we're good and we're doing this. But um, yeah, it was really challenging as a wife to just sit there and realize the deception that had happened that I had zero clue. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Josh and Jalen. This is only part one. We want you to come back to part two as we unpack even more of how did Josh and Jalen get from that point to where they are today uh, when they were sharing earlier about uh, the joy in their marriage? A um, couple things that I heard both of you sharing that I just want to make sure is clear to our listeners. You know, one of the things we do recommend in sex addiction recovery and sexual betrayal recovery is a polygraph when there is um, a need for some sort of accountability for someone. It's not meant to be a punishment, but it always is the spouse's choice. And what it does for the person who's disclosing is it just gives them a sense of accountability and there's freedom in it, actually. It's a loving thing. Um, it's not meant to be used in a court of law. It's meant to be in the process of you're going to have this accountability of this polygraph and here's your chance to do full disclosure. And because oftentimes there is trauma and disassociation and, and we're blocking out for so many years things that we feel shame about, we don't remember it all. And so it does need to be a process um, and it needs to be done well, as Jeff was saying earlier. And so what I don't want is people listening to this and to go home and, <laughs> and to do a full disclosure um, because it's like a bomb going off. And like you said, Jalen, you felt shot so you could do harm. Um, but maybe there's somebody that you can trust uh, that you can maybe start this process with. Maybe it's time to see a counselor. Maybe it's time to meet with your mentor and tell them the full story. Um, but whatever it is that you're feeling as you're listening to the story, we're trusting um, that there is someone in your life that you can connect with, that you don't have to hide anymore. 
And as a wife or a husband who's wondering about things, um, to listen to that, to trust that discernment in you. And uh, Living Wholehearted, we're available. We've got resources and recommendations of people that specialize here if we can't help you. So you can go to livingwholehearted.com, continue to subscribe, and we look forward to unpacking more of Jalen and Josh's story, part two. Thank you for joining us and being a leader committed to shrinking the integrity gap between the values we espouse and the values we actually live out in practice.